and hope you enjoyed Crystal Asige and Koyu from Kenya. Um, Crystal, you saw her on the Activism channel as well, being an artist and a sample of her work. And Koyu is from Music in Africa, who were our facilitator, who are our presenters, who help us with the webinar. Now on uh, to the sixth annual Onget East and Africa Music Summit, on important that we did pretty much here um, with friend Roy, who is conductor at, at Work Limited. So Roy is into the business of financing creatives and and doing uh, this question in action how access finance to grow the arts and grow their business as well. He'll be joined by an esteemed um, panel from and from Tunisia as well in different forms of funding. At this point, I'd like to hand over to Roy Gatai. Thank you, Roy, for curating and putting this panel together. Thank you, Mike. Um, and uh, welcome to all delegates and uh, viewers. Uh, my name, as uh, Mike has said, is Roy Gitahi, and I am the moderator for this particular this particular session. I also call myself a conductor uh, at uh, Art at Work, and uh, the reason for that is because our role is to coordinate uh, different stakeholders to participate in the creative sector, where we're talking about uh, financiers, people who are dealing with education, people who are dealing with technology, people who are dealing with collateral. Um, and when all these teams are at play, um, we we are there to make sure that everything uh, works like a well-oiled machine and a good choir. Today, I have a very, very, very exciting panel, uh, and I'm privileged to introduce them uh, to you. Um, I'll start with the ladies. Uh, there's uh, uh, Wafa. I said her name correctly, I hope. Um, and uh, Wafa is from Tunisia and uh, works, uh, runs, is the CEO of Culture Funding Watch, and they deal with a wide range of um, financial solutions from grants uh, to um, structured finance to bringing um, uh, investors and those who need the investment uh, together. So she plays a very important role here, but I'll also let her talk about uh, Culture Funding Watch um, uh, during this particular session. The other lady that we have privilege to have is Tamara Cook. She's the CEO at uh, uh, financial sector deepening Kenya, FSD Kenya. Many people do not know of FSD, but they probably have experienced their work um, in Kenya as more and more people get access to credit. They're the link and they're the people who make it uh, possible to, to happen. But she will introduce um, FSD in her own words. The third uh, panelist who we have is uh, Fidelis Moyer. Fidelis Moyer uh, represents the Kenya Bankers Association and uh, he's the Director of Technical Services and Innovation. And he's the man who's responsible for answering all the questions that we will be asking today. Why is the bank not giving me money? That is the man that you should be asking that question there too. But I believe even as we go through this particular discussion, um that we will that we will come up with uh, some insights some understanding uh which are the institutions that uh, that are offering financial services what type of financial services that are required what are the institutions that are playing in the background to facilitate this how then can we be able to position ourselves uh to receive uh, financing from these wonderful institutions that have been presented here so straight to the point um, I'll give you a small background and number one is uh, many of you may or may not be aware that 2021 has been declared the UN International Year for the Creative Economy on Sustainable Development. Uh, and number two, it's also been called the Year of Art, Culture and Heritage by the African uh, Union, which is a, actually a very good thing, which means that there's a focus on the creative uh, sector, which now encompasses uh, different aspects, whether it's from film, uh, music, uh, literary works, and uh, and uh, and the, and the like. We also then are looking at uh, in January 20, 2020, we had uh, Af Reg Zimbank, um, 
uh, talking about a $500 million uh, facility to the uh, CCIs or Creative Cultural uh, Industries over the next um, uh, two years. And uh, my first question will be to uh, Fidelis. Fidelis, where's the money? Why are banks not uh, lending to creatives? Oh, okay. Um, thank you for inviting me, Roy. Um, it's a very interesting question. I haven't seen any of the 500. Uh, did you say 500 million? <laughs> 500 million dollars. <laughs> I wish I had a million of those. Um, what um, The problem, I think, is uh, a bit of a misnomer within the economy is that, um, to answer your question, why is it hard for banks to lend to the creatives? Primarily, it's... Um, shall we say, a disconnect between the business models of the creatives and the business model of the financial institutions, in this case, banks. Uh, banks are used to traditional ways of doing business, which is mostly um, a continuous exercise of doing uh, sales or something like that. And mm -hmm. financing, mm -hmm. that is very straightforward because you can see a constant revenue stream. You can be able to predict what will happen in that business. You have a, an audit trail of all the income coming in, and you can basically be able to manage and measure the risk associated with that kind of business. Therefore, a bank can be reasonably assured of getting their money. On the other side of the equation, you have the creatives, which is not really what I would term as a traditional business. They don't send, tend to operate on a monthly revenue stream. If, for example, they were to borrow money, uh, they operate on maybe what we call as a gig economy where sometimes somebody can get a job and the next job is in two, three months. So they don't have a constant revenue flow which can assure a commercial lender that there's money coming in to make sure that they can service a facility. So those are the main reasons uh, why banks consider those particular creatives as, um, shall we say, risky. And so we need to bridge the gap between what we consider the risky and see how banks can understand how creatives do their business so that we can structure something that is aligned. All right, then. That's very, very interesting. Wapa, you also deal with um, uh, funding and finance and uh, those, those kind of um, uh, di different forms of uh, finance. And uh, I see grants are also part of your, uh, uh, part of your portfolio. The, the question is, do grants work like commercial loans? Wafa? Okay, that has, uh, that, that, that has frozen. So um, we'll, we'll get back to Wafa when, uh, when that comes back. But uh, the other person in this conversation is uh, Tamara Cook from uh, FSD Kenya. Um, Fidelis spoke of a disconnect between uh, the creative and the bank. And this is where FSD uh, plays a major role in, uh, in trying to reconcile the differences between, uh, between the two. Uh, tell us about that. Sure. And it does look like Wafa's back, but should I go ahead? I can't. Oh, uh, yeah, please, Wafa. because I'll, I'll, okay. I'll get back Great. to I'll get back to Great. Wafa on the on the same. Yeah. So, um, as you introduced, FSD Kenya Financial Sector Deep Feeding is all about making the financial sector work for everybody, and in general, the financial sector only have really nice collateral, very predictable incomes, and what have you. And the creative sector, like many sectors in Kenya, doesn't have that same kind of predictability. Um, and so I think even if we look, you know, FSD Kenya has done a lot with micro, small and medium enterprises, even just any kind of MSME has not so constant flows. Um, we work a lot with people who work in the informal sector, people who may be doing the kind of gig labor you were talking about that creatives have, but it's, yeah. it may be, I, I work one day at a factory, I work another day um, selling some unga, right? And so what I think has been really impressive about the Kenyan financial sector is that we may have still have a long way to go, but the Kenyan banking sector and the broader financial sector has adapted to do more creative ways of lending. Um, 
taking in alternative data, looking at alternative capital, I mean, uh, collateral, looking, for example, at the movable collateral, which traditionally has not been accepted by banks. And so I think there's there's a lot that we can celebrate, and I think there's a lot we can learn from lending to MSMEs and the informal sector that could be perhaps more applied to the um, creative sector. One of the things that FSD Kenya has been involved with working with the Kenyan government is the digital economy strategy. And under the digital business pillar and that digital economy strategy, we were looking at the creative sector in particular. And obviously the creative sector is much broader than just the digital creative sector, but there's a lot of opportunities there. Right. And there's a lot of opportunities to be able to look at intellectual property as potential collateral. Um, and how can the enabling environment be strengthened so that creatives can use their intellectual property to collateralize lending, for example? Yeah. Um, how, what, how can data be used to capture past income, even if it's not predictable, you might be able to ca you know, capture past data to be able to make future um, decisions about what would be investable or bankable, to use a, a banking term. Um, I also think that um, Kenyans are creative themselves and that most Kenyans look at the banking sector, but they also look at their communities, their chamas, their, you know, their neighbors. And, and I think it's important to consider the financial sector as all of that. Most micro, small and medium enterprises start with lending from friends and family. And so if there's a way that creatives can borrow from friends and families and demonstrate that they pay back, that data could actually be used um, to potentially help them qualify for loans in the future. Anyway, there's a lot I could say, but maybe let me stop there for now. Uh, fantastic. Thanks, Roy. The, the thing is, uh, Wafa, you're back. <laughs> Very good. Wafa from Tunisia. There are different forms of um, financing that are provided. And Fidelis has now spoken about what is more structured. Tamara has now brought in how um, FSD is uh, also trying to facilitate the inclusion of creatives into that particular sector. But um, there's a thinking amongst creatives, by the way, that most of the money that they get is a grant. Uh, and uh, what's your experience with that? It's actually true, like the perception that the only when you are in creative sector in large, cultural creative, the first thinking of resources, it's really grants, which is completely true because I think it's part of the education system, how we educate artists, the school, the curricula. And we tend to think that to make, because what's the ultimate objective? Is to do what they have to do or to run their, to, to, um, run their business. So usually say you need to think, move, actually, not only thinking from grant to investment or loan, it's actually our thinking from grant or finance to resources. And this is why I like better talking about resources mobilization rather than fund or money, because what you need to do whatever you want to do in the cultural creative sector, you need more than only the financial. The finance, when you start talking about resource, then your mind opens. When we talk about money, monetary uh, resources that you need, then you will think of grant because it's in cash. You think an investment is in cash. You would think of business angels as resources to mobilize. So yes, it's true that the general perception of when I want money for my business or for my art project, I only think of grant, which is wrong because um, I think the wrong thinking is to have one mono, uh, a stream of, in, uh, of finance because you will depend on one resource. The sustainable business is built on this strategic and smart combination of those different resources. It's not either or, it's both. And you have to, um, I have to say, bring this together, rent, investment, because all of them alone, they're not enough to help you grow enough and good to be sustainable. And it's actually a, a richesse, how to say, it's a blessing in our sector because it's just a matter of education. We are one of the rare sector, even when you are as an entrepreneur operating in the ICCs, that now you can have grants for your program. So you have both streams, but what we are not good at is to using better the financials like the banking and the commercial financial streams. I will stop there and I will. Okay. Very, very, very interesting because the thing is, the question then becomes, are you, um, are you financiers of individuals or individuals of uh, SMEs 
uh, and structures. And now the, what I see with most uh, creatives is that they are individuals. But the thing is, banks are structured to finance uh, a structured business like MSMEs. So the thing is, um, in that education that you're now talking about, how do we transition people from, uh, how do we split between talent and the business of talent? All right. And so that we can now and be actually, able to start. Actually, it's not really that smooth. Sorry? Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I thought yeah. this was for me. Sorry. All right. So the um, thing is. I think in action, it's not. <laughs> actually it's not yeah. really true that most yeah. are in the freelance because there somehow it's some um, i think we should uh, i mean there is a lot of education to be done from the side of investors and understanding the legal status of creative sector. because in many countries even if they don't have the enterprise legal status or something for example in Indonesia, we're starting now uh, legally structuring the freelancing uh, legal status, so you can have uh, in patent. I don't know the word. Uh, the uh, like a legal status, as and you have your fiscality, you have your thing, you have a legal entity beyond the uh, individual, like moral legal entity. Yeah. As a freelancer, yeah. only one person. Exactly. Yeah. All right. So it's a, it's the same thing that we're now talking about. Is that there's uh, right. there's Roy the creative. And then there's Roy the business, okay? And I think what what we've never been able to do is to be able to separate the two so that we give financial institutions a face uh, to be able to uh, to look at that. So the education is actually important on the same. Fidelis, what's your experience when dealing with, uh, what's the bank's experience when dealing with um, with creatives? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, it's important. Um, what you are talking about is very, very important because um, if you are to approach a commercial bank for facility, uh, what they predominantly want to see is, number one, a business plan. Uh, what are you going to do with that money? So you need to present with them a, to them a proposal saying, I want financing for one to three. That is number one. The second thing is you have to demonstrate to them that you have the ability to pay back the loan once you get the money and you are able to then apply the money in the manner that you have proposed to apply. Then finally, of course, you have to have credibility and this is where most creatives actually have a problem with because they cannot, like Tamara mentioned, have the necessary information to demonstrate in the past that they have actually been able to borrow and been able to pay. So that history of having records that I have borrowed from somewhere else, I've borrowed from somewhere else, and keeping the books of accounts to demonstrate to a bank that you indeed are credible and you are a good person, you are trustworthy, is a very, very big factor that is currently missing from the creative sector, mainly because, like you mentioned, most people who are doing individual businesses don't separate themselves from their business side of things. So, for example, Roy, the artist, is also Roy, the person. So when I get money, I do not separate my business transactions from my personal transactions. So if I'm paying rent, am I paying rent as Roy for my house or am I paying rent for Roy as the studio, rent for studios? I'm keeping records so that the bank can actually track these expenses and see that you're actually able to manage your finances. So those are the things that we need to... Uh, facilitate the creatives to be able to do, to then demonstrate to a financial institution, number one, that they can actually get the money, apply it to the purpose that it is intended to, and then from there, from the proceeds of that, they can actually have the discipline to pay back the money. Because at the end of the day, the bank is there to make sure it takes money from the deposits and lend it to people and then take it back and give it back to the depositors at the end of the day. So that yeah. is how I put it. All right, then. Uh, this question goes to Tamara. Uh, the thing is, because she mentioned uh, some of the initiatives that they're taking in terms of uh, IP as uh, as collateral. And this is quite interesting because most of the creative content or expression um, uh, is intangible. You cannot see it. 
I mean, how does a dancer go and say, please demonstrate what you do and then makes a move and says, how do you value, how, how do you value that? How is that conversation going where we can now be able to use uh, IP as collateral, given that many young people who are in this um, creative sector are not, um, how, how do I say it? Um, they don't have the traditional forms of collateral like land, buildings, logbooks, receivables. They don't have that, but they have their art, they have their music and their IP. Can any of that be used as collateral for Fidelis's loans? In short, the answer is not yet. Um, but I think we're at the beginning of that journey. In the, in the conversations around the digital economy, starting to look at um, intellectual property as a potential asset that could be lent, you know, used as collateral, you have to see what are the protections in place. You know, in some countries, intellectual property law is very strong. And so if I have a copyright, if I, you know, I own it and I can defend it and it's it's something that I could sell. In, in Kenya, the the legal structure for that is not as strong. And so I think the first step is really being able to put the per correct um, uh, safeguards around that. And, and I think there are conversations that are happening to, to make that happen, especially in, in film and, and some of those areas. I have to say, you know, I think we're a long way from being able to copyright the fact that I can dance. But if I've invented a dance that only I can teach, or if I've, um, you know, created a, a manual that, that you know, is, is a way of teaching that, that's something that potentially could be used um, as security. But, but I, I think it's, it, I brought that up, not because I think it's the answer right now, but I think it's part of the answer as we move exactly. forward, right? Exactly. Yeah. So the thing is, Waf uh, Wafa, uh, the thing is, what are your investors looking at, where, especially when they're looking at, uh, making investments into the creative sector uh, are they are they facing the same challenges that fidelis is or are they uh more uh accommodating uh to the shortcomings that uh, fidelis is actually looking at i think actually uh, we I, sh I should say it's the same we're facing the same challenges because I think that not only the continent uh, African, but I think global south, there is a lot of education to be done towards the other end of the financing. And um, but in Tunisia, what we've been trying to do over the, the last three years is actually educate our potential funders by publishing data, by bringing them just to discover. I think what we've been doing for the last three years. Look at this world and this universe and see how does it work before we start asking you for money. So we organize every year something called the resource mobilization meetups and the speed meeting between art financer supporter from Tunisia and abroad to sit and talk and present what they do and how. And we start now uh, having, at least in the Tunisian ecosystem, people who usually don't even think of the sector as something worth investing or something like, for example, the last edition of the Resource Mobilization Marathon, we invited um, uh, a social, corporate social responsibility director of five, six big, big companies in Tunisia. And I just invited them to tell us what's the corporate social... Uh, but in the room, there are 150 culture creative people from Tunisia to talk to them over three hours. And then it just, for some of them, it was like eye-opening and starting, oh, I want to know more about this sector. So it's, it's coming in when, and when it comes, but it takes time. Like, I think when we think about financing cultural creative sector, usually lots of effort are requested and put from the end of the creative people. And the very, at least little, uh, the know I know of, of putting effort in educating the other end of the thing. A lots of lobbying, a lots of advocacy, a lot of research, and as mentioned Tara, Tamara earlier, a lots of data is needed to prepare people to understand the value chain, to understand how the resource and the return investment is done. Okay, so the question okay. then becomes, for people like uh, Fidelis, the bankers, who are looking for a return on investment for every money that they spend, without having to necessarily go for a very long tenure. The question is, who is paying for that education? 
Actually, um, uh, uh, actually, CFW, at least we're doing it from our own pocket because we do believe that it has to be done. But there are financial ways. I mean, there are donors, there are investment, there are, uh, un uh, let's say, ministries and development policy program that could are brought in and they could support that. And I think we're going there now at the continent level. There is more and more, um, how to say, awareness from either decision maker or development uh, agencies that there is a need to recruit donor. Actually, I call it donor recruitment or financial recruitment. So it's a long term and it has to be done. Someone has to start it. Uh, sometimes you may find, find resources to fund that, but sometimes it usually actually doesn't really need that much investment. The event we're doing, it costs uh, one month of my team work and uh, three, uh, maybe three, four thousand dollars. And we did it. We had a room with the 150 people, donors, investors and, and cultural creative people. Um, we are also now organizing the RMD, which is the biggest online speed meeting between art supporter worldwide and culture. Mm -hmm. And my budget so far is $3,000. And by the way, I take the opportunity, please come and join. It's free for everybody. <laughs> that's that, that's fine. It's actually very encouraging to hear, uh, to hear that. Uh, and the thing is, the fact that you're talking about a lot of... Um, uh, funding that is required for education for research which is what uh, i believe fsd is uh, is is uh, is currently is currently doing i am aware that they have um, already gotten into um, a research engagement with um, a company called art at work which i run and uh, and kenya bankers association uh, but the thing is as um, as Kofa says and this is to tamara um how 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 consistent will that data be uh, or what's the commitment that we have that uh, that uh, m uh, more research will be done into this particular field with an aim of getting data that will facilitate interventions that will attract investment into this particular sector you know it's an excellent question and we are really um, excited about that research that we're doing with you and KBA. I think it's really important. I think the history of banking in Kenya shows us that when we have more research data and insights about a new sector, lending follows. It doesn't always follow immediately. It doesn't always follow as much as we might like initially, but that is the history of the Kenyan banking sector. When I used to work in a, one of the banks here in Kenya, we knew the tea sector really well. We had been in it forever. We lent to tea farmers and we understood tea. Then we wanted to move into py pyrethrium. We didn't know pyrethrium. We needed to learn about pyrethrium to be able to lend into that sector. I think the creatives is, is, is the same. It may not be an agricultural value chain, but I really love the fact that Wafa talked about it as a value chain. Understanding where does the revenue come from? What are the risks? What is the frequency of the revenue? Um, these are things that the research can point us to. And with greater understanding, the questions that Fidelis was talking about can be answered. And if those questions can be answered, then lending decisions can be made. One thing I would like to, again, just compliment Wafa on is the, the idea of resource mobilization. It is important for creatives not to think that they should always go for grants, but also not always for loans. If something is incredibly risky, loans may not be the right tool. Loans are, I'm going to put on a play. I know so many people are going to buy tickets. Therefore, I need a loan to hire the hall. That is an appropriate use for a hall because you're pretty sure that revenue is going to come. Something that is much more risky, you might want the angel investors that you talked about or grants or, or whatever. And so I think it's important to make sure that we better understand each of these sectors across the creative sector and, and how to match the right resources and the right tools to gather those resources um with with the needs and the opportunities right. <laughs> exactly so the thing is i know many people have uh, looked at the creative sector as a very risky sector but this is why i see young people moving towards i mean when we were growing up we were told become a doctor a lawyer an engineer a pilot one of those things but when i look at my kids they have little or no interest in those particular fields they want to become uh, comedians, they want to become uh, dancers, footballers, and all those kind of things that my mother would blow a fuse on. 
um, uh, and that. But the question then becomes, since there's so many of them, where are the institutions to support those career ambitions, okay? And the other question then becomes, if a dancer or a comedian went to the bank and asked for a loan, the answer right now is almost laughable. But the thing is, uh, how do we expect these young people to grow their careers without the participation of financial institutions such as uh, such as Fidelis? I'm glad that uh, uh, Wafa is has already started that particular process. And Tamara, as you rightfully said, there are layers of uh, from that you can get financing from from the family. And then when you graduate to an external person, it's a grant that is an angel investor moving up to, you know, uh, loans, a venture capitalist and uh, selling equity and that kind of thing. But those structures have to be put in place to appeal to the different um, uh, players, uh, financial players in this particular field. Whose work is that? I like the silence. So Tamara, you're smiling. So hey, t tell us what think you think. It's all of our work. Um, I mean, what? As I said at the beginning, FSD Kenya, we're all about looking at where is the market failing? Where is the financial market not meeting the needs of of the real world? And it, and what I'm hearing today, loud and clear, is the creative sector says it's not working yet. And so I do think that you know players like ourselves can look at what's broken and why and, and what can be fixed. But it really is about the market seeing the need and, and finding creative ways to uh, serve creatives. All right, Wafa, what do you think? Uh, also, I think it's also when, uh, when we talk also on the value chain on an ecosystem, something is really missing in the different ecosystem and the influencing and recruiting donor, reflecting on how to finance and smart financing for the ICCs is a full-time job. It's a skill. And then it's not something that you do aside. In different in all these ecosystems, there must be a someone or some entity or some university that sole mission and interest is and expertise is towards financing ICCs. It's, it's as you said, Tamara, we are in the beginning. And the beginning, it requires a lot of advocacy concerted from different sides, coordinating to be efficient. And it's not one person job. It's if you want to really become good experts in financing our ICCs, there must be experts in finance and ICC. That's their job. And we need to either we do it together, like you create task forces that are financed together or raise resources together to just do that. I believe that it's something that we read seriously to invest and not a side activity of our different activities and things. All right, then. All right, then. So, Fidelis. sorry, uh, Fidelis, uh, this, this, this question is to you. Um, knowing that the, there's a creative sector that has got a huge potential for um, new customers, for people who are looking for uh, there's, there's potential for growing that particular loan book for your member banks. What do you feel that Kenya bankers can be able to do to facilitate uh, this particular process beyond the research that uh, that has been commissioned by um, FSD Kenya? Well, right, like you rightly point out, we need to understand the business. Tamara has mentioned about understanding the value chain and then being able to identify the potential interventions needed and the opportunities that are then availed. She also rightly pointed out that um, financial sector is just more than the banking sector. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to do a study of the creative sector. What are the players? Who are the players? How do they make their money? What are the different forms of uh, creatives are we talking about? Then once we do that, we can then get a better understanding of the sector itself. Then the different member banks can then identify which side of the value chain would they want to participate. So, for example, if it is in film, um, there would be a financial institution that would be very happy to lend against the equipment because they know they can then take the equipment as collateral. But if they don't understand how this equipment is repaid back and all, then obviously they would consider it very risky. So what we are trying to do is to understand 
how do these creatives work? Who are the players in there? And what are the connections between the players? What are the interventions necessary? And then how do we de-risk the sector? Uh, Tamara mentioned about uh, tea and, uh, and coffee and pyrethra. It's the same model we approached by looking at the system, the value chain, and then identifying the potential risks and then looking for ways to de-risk the very heavily considered risks and then see one way of addressing those risks, how would we then address those risks, and then interventions that can then be put in place. So the first thing is to understand the ecosystem, understand the players in the ecosystem and how they interact. And then from there, that will demystify uh, the sector to the players. I like what Osa said they did, get all these people into a room to talk so that they can express themselves and say, this is how I do my business. Then the other guy says, well, this is how I fund my business. Then with that conversation, then they can say, well, if you change this and that, then we can accommodate each other. And then you find people willing to then experiment with a small amount of money and putting and see what happens. Then as confidence grows, then you can create lines of, of business through that. So I think that's the approach we are looking to do. And from the study, we will be able to then identify potential areas we can look at member banks to show them these are the potential areas for your business. And once they see that, they can then dig deeper into them and let them engage with the creative players and see where they can get together. So that's what I think. All right then, so that's fine. <laughs> and the thing is, uh, we've not actually talked about the role of government in uh, this, uh, this, whole, um, uh, this, whole, uh, this whole process. I know that the Kenyan government uh, introduced the credit guarantee scheme of uh, 2020. Um, and I know that was meant to de-risk or offer guarantee to banks or financial institutions that are headed in that particular, um, in, in that particular space. But uh, Fidelis, is that enough? Well, um, the credit guarantee scheme is a de-risking scheme right now for MSMEs, like Tamara mentioned. They are the ones everybody is focusing on. Uh, this is primarily because people don't understand the creatives. So if the creative could then put a formal structure in their business, for example, if I am a, a budding playwright and I have a group of players, then we can form a company, which is a small medium enterprise, and then we can make an application that, yes, we have registered ourselves, we have our records of the KRA, we have all these businesses, we have a place of doing business. Then it can be looked at as a business. But right now, everybody is doing their own things as individuals. So we need to, first of all, formalize these creatives to some form of business that can be then looked at as business. We've already written to the National Treasury together with the Ministry of Culture, Social Sciences, or Social Culture, social, sports, and arts. Ministry of sports, culture, and sports, yeah, culture. very long title. Yeah, <laughs> that ministry. We have written such that like those groups that form themselves into MSMEs that have registered with the Ministry of Culture or Department of Culture can then be considered as MSMEs under the credit guarantee scheme, and therefore the element of risk can be underwritten for potential lending from commercial banks. But the underlying thing here is that the commercial banks must understand the business that they will go into. So that study will then give us an understanding of how this business works. And then the guarantee will come to de-risk the heavy risk that we all see. And then hopefully that will make it attractive for them to enter into the market. All right, fantastic. Um, Wafa. Do you, uh, does the Tunisian government <laughs> have any incentives that, uh, that, uh, um, for the creative sector? Uh, or are you working uh, independently outside the support of uh, government? Um, uh, CFW, we work independently from the government, but we work a lot with the government. Uh, uh, actually, the Tunisian government has a very good let's say, pioneering history in supporting the ICCs. We have a, a, a guarantee, uh, fond de garantie, how to say that? Sorry for the English and French. Um, a bank guarantee, -led, it's called the fond produit, and it exists, I think, at least like seven to 10 years ago. Of course, it hadn't really worked because again, as I said earlier, working on only one side of the value chain, it won't work. 
if there is a, a, a good banker and uh, and just knows about it that the banker because it's government that the banker doesn't understand it won't really work so they are reworking it you know it took time but i think maybe because it was too pioneer actually we're talking 10 years ago but a lot is happening now in tunisia um, I, but i would like to talk also i mean maybe you bring it later in terms of innovative um financing something came and it's really new after the COVID. So these, there are new funding and financial streams through uh, online, through these new platforms that live streaming and get paid. And so um, this is something that also we need to follow and invest in. Uh, I'm having a session tomorrow live on CFW. I'm inviting three new online things like the crowdfunding, the uh, mobile payment uh, and another yeah. system. So these are also things that we need to think of as a financial ways to sustain the sector. All right. All right. I think that is fine. And Tamara, you, you, have, uh, you, you have had a very good relationship with banks and also with government. Um, is there more that can be done for the creative sector? Yes. Uh, I was at a I was at an event this morning, and a government official said that every time a new government person st starts, people come with their bulls asking, <laughs> asking for more. But but I think um, what's important is to look at the enabling environment. It's not about government giving handouts. It's actually about government setting in place the rules, the structures, the information, so that the creative sector can grow. And lending may be part of that, angel investors may be part of that, but sometimes lending isn't the, always the best option. I mean, maybe sometimes it's better to start small and grow and grow and use your savings to grow. And, and so I, I do think it's important. I know, I know the topic today is credit, but I, I, I think it's important to just think more overall about the financial health of creatives so that people understand their financial position. They understand all of the different financial tools that they can use from savings to pension, right? All the way, all the way to the end and, and really think holistically about the role of finance. So I think that, um, yeah, I, I could say more, but I, I, I do think that the enabling environment is really where the government has the biggest role to play in enabling the sector. All right, then. Fantastic. Uh, I also find that there are other factors that uh, play um, a role, which are basically non financial but are more social um, and I find that uh, because uh, creatives are living in a certain reality but they have an ability to create an alternate reality and the difference between those two worlds by the way creates issues around mental health around uh, drugs alcohol and substance abuse around uh, radicalization sex uh, and uh, reproductive health all right, related uh, related issues. Now the thing is, none of those, ad, ad, uh, and of course, not failing to address those particular issues, then uh, leads to um, uh, a creative not being productive in their in their particular field. Now the question is, um, what do we? What are your ideas around um, uh, addressing? Those particular, those particular issues that do not give a return on investment, but are important for a creative to become productive. All right, and I'll, I'll uh, Wafa. Okay, so, sorry. Um, um, that's, I think the COVID has changed a lot, that reality. Um, and it's a pity that as a sector, we're not properly capitalizing on that. The fact that the only way for every single person worldwide to survive that horrible lockdown and this distancing was the, was the cultural creative sector. It was the arts. It was people could not survive without the music, the books, the films. And then it's, it, we need, now the, we have a corridor open to say, you know what? We are a priority. Because when there is a crisis like this, the first thing that the people found refuge in was our sector. The sector that was the most used to educate people about the best practices during the COVID, the hand washing, etc. What was it? It was the art and creative sector. So 
-hmm. It's just us organizing to capitalize and valorize this better. It's, it, it, and it's coming. So we have read, here is an opportunity and we need, really need to invest in that and capitalizing in what happened with COVID and how important we are. All right. Tamara, what are your thoughts around um, around um, investments that do not give a return on investment, um, but are important and critical in uh, in the development of the sector? I mean, the issues you just mentioned are are many, um, and and I can't pretend to be experts on all of those areas. Um, but I think it is important, you know, when we're doing financial analysis. You know, that's the, I'm, I, I, in some ways, I feel like I'm not cool enough to be at this event, right? I'm not creative. I'm just this finance person, right? Um, but when we do financial analysis, we have to understand the context within which that is, right? And so the things that you're talking about in terms of um, safety, mental health, um, sexual reproductive health, those things are incredibly important to understand as the context. But we also know that when people, um, when people are living on little money, they're more likely to end up down bad paths in those areas. And so I think the more we can do to help stabilize people's income and give them the financial resources they need to kind of have some more of that stability, then some of these broader societal issues can be prevented. Fantastic, excellent answer. Well, uh, um, Fidelis, yeah, top that one. Um, it is very hard to talk. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, one should not really look at just financing the creatives. Like you mentioned, the social structure of the environment within which the creatives operate is a very, very important aspect. And that's why we really need to look at the financial sectors and its offerings beyond just credit. Like Tamara mentioned, we are just talking credit today. But I'm looking at, for example, insurance. If the artist has no insurance, then you can be sure the next gig he gets, he's going to start worrying about uh, how he is medical and all that thing. So we need to look at how can we give them alternative products that can then assure them of the social structure and give them a sort of safety net that in the event the gig doesn't pay out, there's a way of getting their money back. I like the way uh, you have Wabuni Sako where they have a form of savings which is a social service in, in, in itself, such that if the gigs are not available, at least I can be able to be tidied over until the next gig. So those are the things yeah, beyond yeah. financing that we should be looking at so that there's the safety nets around the artists and they don't feel like they are left um, high and dry, so to speak. So that is my little contribution. I hope I have been able to reach a, a third of <laughs> this. <laughs> No, that is that is fantastic because it brings me now to the next question. So now let's bring it down to I am a creative. And right now, uh, today being the 24th day of February 2021, I am looking for a facility uh, or I have this project that I want to launch. What's your advice to me? Wafa, go first. Yeah. Um, first would be sit down and think it through together. Look for different resources because what you need is only money. You may need technical assistance, you need accompaniment, you need uh, money, of course. So my advice to them is sit down, think it through, ask around first, look around what's being done in the similar to the idea you have in your mind and then look around what are the resources available for you out there? So do your mapping. Who gives uh, incubation, how to access, who gives technical assistance, who gives money, who gives grants? And then starting from that, you would start doing your fundraising or resource mobilization strategy. It starts with mapping. Map what's out there and what fits with your needs. And that's, again, okay. it comes RMD, why we're doing it? Actually, the RMD, it's a, a worldwide speed meeting donor mapping in a very short time. So over 24 hours, an artist who attends such event will be meeting at least six, seven donors and be hearing what they do, how, when, and what are the condition. The aim is that the first step is really do your mapping. Okay. 
I, I think that, that that is good. Uh, Tamara, what um, I'm I'm an artist. Uh, day one, looking for funding. Um, I have this project. What's your advice to me? So, I, I don't know for sure. But the thing, the first thing that occurred to me is that you have to know your audience. So you need to know who it is you're asking for money and how you can scratch their itch. And so you if sometimes what I've seen is that people will pitch the whole project and it's good to have a vision, but maybe what's the right thing is to say, here's phase one, here's the costs of phase one, here's the potential revenue of phase ones, so here's the risks, but here's the huge upside that I'm hoping for. And here's why I think I'm gonna get it. And if you can pitch it in, in bite-sized chunks in ways that meet the questions that are gonna be in the head of the person you're approaching for financing, um, I think you'll have a better chance. All right, fantastic. That's that's actually very good. Uh, Fidelis. Yes. So beyond my shades, dreadlocks, and uh, sagging <laughs> jeans. Yes. Um, how would you advise? <laughs> I, would, I would advise a business approach to things, um, primarily for two reasons. Um, in addition to what has been said, if you can show whoever it is you are approaching that, number one, you have a vision. Number two, you are professional about it, not your looks, but... For example, you have a document that details what it is you want to do. You already have, for example, um, you've separated your business from your yourself. So you have the business side. This is your act. This is how you are doing it. You've documented the process. You have contracts with your suppliers to show that you are formalizing the thing. Then it starts looking like it's a well-packaged thing. And whoever you present then sees you have put some thought behind it rather than just come with those, we used to call it winging, when you come to a presentation without any sort of preparation and you're just hoping something will stick to the wall. So if you think through the idea, document it, and then put formalized uh, in a business presentation way, and then of course you come prepared with all the questions you've thought about so that if you asked a question, you really have thought about the answers then that gives you a better chance, whichever way you are proposing, whether it's a pitch or a, for funding or a pitch for a job, that would be the best way to do it such that you look like you are well-prepared professional. Okay, Wafa, you, you look like you have a comment. I want also to build on what Tamara was saying. So when I said you do your mapping, it's like you see what are the different resources. And the second, the next step to that is to assess is that the resource that I need now, or is that the best, my best option? I'm gonna give you a very simple example. Sometimes when I advise my client and people that I am accompanying on resource mobilization, I said, okay, you map. I will see there is a bank guarantee, and there is grant, and there is file loan, and there is technical assistance, and there is incubation. Now we look of each, and sometimes you can find, and there is a lot, in, uh, and then other resources that people don't look at. It's the uh, technical assistance. Let's an example. In Tunisia, there is a, a big bank that provides a technical assistance program to SMEs in Tunisia. And it's not focusing on sector. So us as a sector, we're eligible. And I like the technical assistance better than the grant, even better than, than the grant. Why? Because I look to my client, I say, okay, what's the technical assistance? Actually, it's Tell us what you want. For example, I want to develop a platform for my idea, or I want someone to do my sales strategy or to make for my video and uh, commercial um, uh, communication plan, etc. You go to this technical assistance facility and you just write your TR, just your needs. And they take in charge finding the right service provider to do that for you and they pay him. So if I look at it, this my need is to develop a platform. The different resources available for me to do that, it's either I go for a loan or I get a grant or there is a TA. So the advantage of a TA is I don't get the hassle. If I go for a grant, I will have to write a proposal, to, work, to provide all the invoices, to write the final report, to bind by eligible, uh, what's it called, the visibility and communication guidelines, all this work behind, which is a huge. When I do a TA and if I go to loan or what it happened, I will have to, the money will come into, if I am a company, will get into my account, gets out. So that's a flow, that's tax, that's income, which is actually an investment. When I do a TA, 
None of this happens. I just give a TOR for finding the, all the paperwork, finding the consultancy, signing with them, sending the invoices, no report, and you get the job done. So that's what is a smart resource mobilization for your idea. It, there is not one perfect tool, as said Tamara earlier. It's where you are and what's the best, I call it return and investment in your energy. How much energy I input in accessing that resource and what I get in return. In this case, in terms of return investment for mobilizing a resource from my platform is the TA. It's not the grant. It's not the, the, the loan. So that's the thinking. Okay. Uh, actually, very, very, quite, in, quite impressive, especially when you think about it, that uh, money may not be the only solution uh, to most of those things, and especially institutions like uh, like uh, government, Atatwa, Kenya Bankers, and FSD have the ability now to start off those uh, TA, uh, T, TA platforms. And of course, we'll be looking forward for that. Yes, Fidelis, uh, you want to make a comment? No, I, I couldn't agree more with what Wava is saying because, um, for example, the KBA has an SME advisory team where we actually advise SMEs on how to prepare for loans, how to create loans, and how to do all that. So if you are struggling in that area, then of course, that is a very, very nice resource that you can leverage from experts, people who probably will not charge you. They do it as a, should we say, a CSR or as part of their job. So those are the resources we are talking behind finances, besides finances that you can leverage from other resources. All right, fantastic. Uh, Tamara, any facilities that exist like that in uh, FSD? Uh, not exactly. We're 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 more behind the scenes than uh, direct uh, benefit. Um, but I did actually want to bring up the concept of payments, which is not something we've talked a lot about. But the fact that Kenya is yeah. a real leader in digital payments, and 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 even um, you mentioned the mobile payments in Tunisia. Um, I think the fact that you can do micro payments and that you can do them fast has been a good thing for the creative sector. It's created new business models. It's created new ways of monetizing um, art. And so I, I think that not only is that an opportunity to earn some often smaller revenue, but more of it, um, but it's also a way to collect that data that we were talking about earlier. And so I just want to celebrate the fact that with Kenya's digital payments journey, um, that's an opportunity for the creative sector, not only to earn income, but to demonstrate their ability to earn income, which should be able to be used in loan decisions. And I, I see Fidelis shaking his head. And so I, I think that yeah. that's something that, that we can celebrate and I think we can build even more on. And COVID showed us how a lot of these e-commerce platforms um, have included a lot of the creatives on them. Um, and I think there's been some growth in that sector um, when a lot of sectors have actually been hard hit. I'm actually nodding right. in agreement because um, you couldn't have put it better, Tamara, because, for example, if you look at um, these things of ringtones, there are quite a number of Kenyans who have created very innovative ringtones that would ordinarily not sell if they were not able to get these small, small payments. And these small, small payments actually are adding up. And you'll be surprised some of the people are actually living comfortably off those because, number one, they are, they are leveraged in terms of the rich using the mobile network systems in Kenya. So it's a very, very yeah. low, affordable way of reaching millions of consumers. They are getting paid through the micropayment platform, so they don't have a very large cost in terms of getting their money. So it's a very low cost um, payment system for them. Most of them are actually free for the kinds of monies they get. So we can leverage off that. And I'm sure we have platforms, Roy could tell you about like mdundo.com and such. The government of Kenya, the Kenya Copyright Board is actually collecting a lot of royalties for the musicians from entertainment, matatus and the joints where um, artists are actually getting their revenues. If they can then be able to show a lender that I have these revenues coming through, then it is a credible way of showing revenue coming through that is consistent that then they can use to leverage and get financing for bigger jobs and pay off through that as a comfort. So I think you are on the right track, Tamara, and I agree with you fully. Yeah, yeah I, um, 
I think usually my dilemma when uh, moderating this particular things is that uh, I have to be the moderator and then art at work has to take um, a backstage in, uh, in in this particular moderations because we're now trying to get. You want me to ask you a question topic, so you can answer it? <laughs> what would art at work <laughs> say about this? <laughs> well, uh, technology plays a very important role, especially in the creative sector, especially from the production of uh, of content, uh, distribution of content, and also in monetization of um, of of, uh, of content. It's one of the other areas that we're looking to get into research on um, to basically find out what technologies are available, how many of them are supported by local telcos, and um, because at the end of the day, what it does is that. It, it begins to bring in predictability uh, into uh, or insight into the content that is being produced, who is consuming that particular content, how they're monetizing that particular content for, for financial institutions then to use that data as a basis to be able to lend to um, uh, to, to creative. So we're looking at, um, and, and, and I could not agree more with uh, uh, um, Wafa where she said, that uh, COVID actually did um, change uh, the way we, 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 we do things because um, you have got two things that I find very unique about the creative sector. While, while character may be one of the challenges that they face, their products are separate from, uh, from the character that produced them. So the question is, can then we look at ways to finance the products that creatives are then are then producing. So we jump over the character hurdle there that is uh, that is there. The next thing that we are also now beginning to think about is uh, on those particular creative products. Uh, we are looking at IP. We are now looking at uh, cop uh, copyright. How can that be monetized or tokenized uh, to become um, uh, a, a revenue source for 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 creatives? And everybody has that now. Kenya Copyright Board. Uh, just requires you to register your works and all of a sudden they are paying you royalties which is basically on um, on uh, not a scientific way but basically um, uh, I don't know what the term they use on, uh, on on that one but on a general yes on general distribution those are things that then can now be able to use to build a portfolio around the creative that then the banks can now be able to use for uh, for lending but all those are now technology based if you look at OTT platforms, just like the one that uh, my movies, uh, my movies Africa by our hosts today, um, and the thing is, people being able to uh, watch that. You're now looking at phones that can be able to receive content, uh, which means that we can now start building subscriptions and subscriber bases that then guarantee that uh, creatives can now be able to uh, monetize that. And the phones that are there, you now have front-facing cameras, back-facing cameras that can then be able to produce content. And content now is not just about comedy or anything like that. It could be just my day at work and somebody just wants to know how did Roy, how did Roy fare. And th those kind of things, provided you can then come up with a, a methodology where people can click and actually earn some money, um, then we now begin to start looking at ways where people are earning revenue for products that they have done. Those platforms exist. The question is, how then do we bring them together? How do we build this ecosystem where we can now be able to benefit that particular uh, that particular creative? Um, yes, back to the moderator. So the question then becomes, <laughs> um, if if we're now looking at those those structures, and I believe this being the uh, the year for the creative sector to for sustainable development, the question then becomes: uh, what what resources are we looking at that can be avail availed this year to be able to make such infrastructure investment uh, that then will uh, produce a foundation for creatives to be able to thrive. All right. So Tamara, um, where do we think, um, where do you think those resources will come from uh, to be able to build a foundation for uh, for us to set up the infrastructure for then creatives to be able to thrive? Again, I, I don't know the answer. Um, if I did, we wouldn't be having All this right. panel, and right? Because the question would have already been answered. 
Um, but what I would like to say, and as I was kind of reflecting while you were speaking, is that creatives are good at telling stories. They tell stories with you know, music, color, movement, words. Um, and, and I think that what we need is to apply some of the creative's talents to telling the story to financiers. But it needs to be the story that they wanna hear, that they're gonna buy. And so if we can use the talents in this sector to tell stories to those who can enable that infrastructure and that foundation that's needed, I think that would be um, a good way to, to move forward. All right. So, Fidelis, would you finance a play to be told a story to your bankers? I'm open to any suggestion that will uh, advance the conversation. So, yes, um, it would be a starting point because you have to start somewhere, essentially. Um, Kenyans are very creative at coming up with solutions, and the idea is to get them together, to point them at a problem, and we can craft some solutions. I mean, some of the things you mentioned are already in place. It's a matter of picking this and that and putting it together. So um, yes, we, we are able to do it. And the framework which we are discussing can actually be brought up together because the, the puzzle pieces are there. It's just a matter of putting the jigsaw together to get something moving. Okay, Wafa, uh, back to you. You seem to have uh, gotten a system or a framework of um, of investors uh, uh, and uh, grant makers and people who are interested in this particular creative sector um, and being able to marry them with, uh, with the people who actually need that particular help. Uh, how long did it take you to develop that? It took us, now we are, I mean, we started this idea of creating the space for them to connect, just to sit together in the same room, uh, uh, four years now. And um, with the no, really no means, I think I'm saying this to give hope to everyone. We don't need a huge means. I had zero means to do this. I just uh, been smart, again, financial. What I want to do and what's the best way to get it resourced? So at the start, I had no money and I had nobody understand even what I'm talking about. So what I did, I went to a, a major festival in Tunisia and told them, you know what, in your program, we like this. I mean, organizing a side event, so let me do this crazy thing and I don't want to be paid. So I used their name to bring these people to sit in this oh, national wow. and international. And at the third edition, I mean, the first edition was like, okay, 20 people in the thing. <laughs> but then the third one, 150. So, and now it's global. Now at the RMD, I have like more than 50 donors that confirm it participation in there worldwide. And we have already more than 1,000 people registered in the event. And we are just at the beginning. We just opened the pre-registration. So it didn't took that much money. And it took that just three years with the little means. Imagine if we have started with huge means, like we could have had the set impact. I think it's not, it's a matter of two, three years. You start having impact, like start people listening. You start, and it's not actually, it's un peu prétentieux, very pretentious to say, I did it or someone did it. There is a many element that has to be there. So the, 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 uh, the context, I arrived in a time and it started this idea in the time that the ecosystem also is getting mature. There is extra and more and more interest. So there are many factors. And I think the context now at the continent wide is propitious, is um, favorable for this to happen in every country. It's just a little of structure perseverance and a little budget it doesn't take that much to do okay and uh, much much appreciated much appreciated on that particular answer there's um th there's a question especially when you talk about um creatives there's uh, what is called the kiman risk uh, mm -hmm. in the whole thing and i think uh, uh fidelis uh, alluded to uh, uh, alluded to it uh, especially when you're saying that you need to bring in other industries like insurance and uh, uh, onto that uh, onto onto that particular uh, plate, um, and of course we are now talking about a finance sector that is um, I don't like calling them risk averse uh, because uh, uh, banking is the business of risk, all right? So which is almost like an oxymoron between the two. Um, but the question then becomes. Uh, and and this is uh, th this is to Fidelis. We now have a credit scoring system, which is basically the CRB, 
um, and we had um, uh, I always say creatives are usually eligible uh, for for listing on uh, on on uh, on CRB, and this was proven true when we had a report that there were 14 million people uh, on CRB at this particular at this particular time. Um, how then does that affect the efforts of trying to get people into financial inclusion when already there's a system that has already uh, ex excluded them? So I'll go to Fidelis first and then uh, to, to, to Tamara on the same. Well, uh, let me first correct the impression about the CRB. The CRB as it operates in Kenya is um, what is considered as a full file reporting system, which means it reports both your good data and your bad data. That way I get a full picture of uh, Fidelis as a person. We have those other CRBs that list what is considered a blacklist, only the defaulters only. And that is not very good because it only names the bad guys. But in our system of listing, where we list you in the CRB, we list both your good records, where you have all the performing loans that you have. And then we, if, if you have any defaults, we also list that. That way then, any potential lender that goes to that uh, listing will see the, your portfolio of good vis-a-vis -vis your portfolio of bad. You are right in that banking system is not risk averse. It is actually pricing the risk. So what we do is we take your good attributes versus your bad attributes and then put a price to it. That way, if you are a good risk, then you get a good price. If you are a bad risk, then you get um, a bad price, so to speak. So I think that's the context under which we should discuss uh, the CRB. And it's good for somebody to be on the CRB, especially if you are performing loans, because it gives you a leverage. When you go to a bank or a financial institution, you tell them, look, if I've been able to service a mortgage for 20 years, surely you can give me a loan for two years. And that, that works. OK. Uh, uh, excellent. To Tamara. Um, CRB, uh, and, and the thing is, and the reason I ask Fidel is first is because banks are considered goalkeepers, as especially more the CRB was more to stop you from getting a facility as opposed to rating you for a particular facility. And that many people feel that uh, CRB has excluded them uh, from uh, financial uh, financial services, but what's your opinion on the same? Yeah. No, I, I really agree with what Fidelis was saying, and, and I think that Kenya should celebrate the fact that we are a full file uh, CRB reporting. I was working with one fintech who was trying to um, educate their clients around the CRB, and they were explaining, you've paid off your loan with us, so we've reported that to the CRB. We've told them that you are a good payer. And, and the client said, really? Great, can you call my SACO? Can you call my landlord? Can you call and tell them that my record's there? <laughs> you know, and so it was this idea of, wow, this is a place where I can show good things and, and not just bad. I, I think the press has made much of this idea of a blacklist. And, and the, I'd like to let you in on a secret. There is not actually a blacklist anywhere. There's some negative information and there's positive information. And where I think lenders need to be careful is that there are some lenders who use that information as a binary decision rather than using it as a full file decision, which helps them understand the risk and price it the way that Fidelis has just talked about. And so I do think that um, we're still not all the way to where we'd like to be on that credit market information sharing um, status, but I think that um, we should see that as an opportunity um, and, and understand um, the ways it can be misused. Okay. So are there alternatives to uh, credit reports uh, by, apart from CRB, are there any other parameters that can be looked at, uh, especially when gauging um, someone for eligibility uh, to, to finance outside uh, what is traditionally now known as uh, the CRB? Sure. I mean, I think we, we can look at alternative data besides credit data. Um, and so, I, I mean, you know that there are many digital lenders um, in Kenya who use alternative data, which can be everything from your mobile money usage to your airtime usage to the number of contacts on your phone. Um, let me be clear. Some of those lenders have um, misused that information. 
Um, but there are a lot of opportunities to help better understand the full picture of a person beyond just bank records. Um, and so I do think that there, it's important to, again, look holistically um, at people and look at a wide range of data, not just one particular set. All right, then. That's fine. Fidelis, so um, are banks applying that uh, for rating or are banks applying that to prevent people from um, accessing uh, funds? Because right now the environment gets uh, difficult. You find that uh, risk is not one of those things that the banks really want to, to take um, at, at this particular time. And of course, then the, the, your uh, uh, credit information then becomes the reason why credit managers will say, you know what, that we will not be able to lend to. Uh, I'll let you in on a secret. It's actually illegal to decline a loan specifically based on a credit report. Uh, you are supposed to look at the whole picture. The credit report is supposed to make you understand. For example, if I've defaulted, the credit report is supposed to tell the bank why I defaulted rather than the fact that I'm a defaulter. And so the conversation around it is, can I price your risk because you have shown some default? So for example, if I have a clean record, which means I have three loans in the CRB which are performing, I can get a loan at, let's say, 7%. But if Roy, who has two loans, one has defaulted and one is still performing, uh, they can then say, yeah. okay, based on this, we can attach a risk factor to you of 2%. Therefore, we will lend you at 9%. So you see, they are pricing on the basis of your risk. That is what banks do. They don't look at you and say, you're in the CRB, uh, please leave the room. No. What they do is they look at your total picture and then they price you vis-a-vis -vis the risk that they see. And that's why the importance of both the good and the bad data in a CRB report. All right, fine. So the thing is this education that we need. Oh, Wafa, uh, any comments on that, um, on, on, on uh, credit rating? All right then, fantastic. Now the thing is we all mentioned education as we have gone along in this whole thing. And it's not just education on the creative. It's actually education to the particular stakeholders. Because the thing is, when we're talking about uh, banks, they're, they're those who will deal with, for example, I always feel that we have a good relationship with CXO level kind of uh, people when we're having this kind of discussion, by the way. But at the end of the day, down there is the relationship manager who you will meet, uh, who basically has the visuals to the person that he's about to lend to. There's also the credit manager who will also assess this particular thing. The question is, is how do we get education to that level of people to have the same understanding that the CXO level um, uh, has? Uh, Fidelis? Um, actually, education goes both, both ways. Um, you want the creative to be educated on what they need to provide to the bank to enable the bank make a decision. So there's the element of creatives need to understand what is the bank looking for, what information is the bank looking for. Then again, you are writing that the decision makers in the banking industry also need to understand what the creative is all about. I mean, um, you mentioned most of the creatives dress in uh, what shall we say unconventional ways. So if a guy walks into yes. a banking hall dressed like that, there are certain impressions that the bank officer gets. So we need to break that barrier of the physical characteristics or the looks and educate the bank officers into what business or what is the business behind the creative such that they can have a conversation beyond just taking a look and saying, I don't like the look of this guy. So we have work to do both sides. Uh, we have to educate the market in terms of what the provider is looking for. And we have to educate the provider to make sure that they understand how the market works so that they can then be able to have a conversation and not talk at, at each other. Okay. The next question that I have then is, does the bank in Kenya have a scorecard uh, that, uh, that, that, that actually designed for creatives? The, the quick answer to that is no. Uh, most of the lendings that happens to the creatives right now 
is based on the traditional personal lending. So you will find that they have what most banks refer to unsecured lendings or secured lendings, which then becomes a problem because those ones are based on, shall we say, monthly income. And if you can't then demonstrate a monthly income, then clearly that is not happening. So what we are looking at is to make sure that the industry can understand how the creative value system works, how they make their money, how they get paid in what form and how frequently, such that then we can develop products that are aligned to them. Tamara mentioned about the farming. That's the same thing we did with farmers. Farmers who are seasonal planters who basically harvest every, shall we say, three months, obviously would not have benefited from a facility that requires a monthly payment. So what the banking industry did is understand the flows within the agriculture sector and then align products that are then tuned to those repayment periods. So if I'm a farmer who grows maize and I harvest my maize every month, then the bank would give you a facility and know that I will only repay after I harvest, which is three months. Therefore, they would also structure the facility accordingly. That is the kind of um, thing we seek to do so that you have products that fit the, the demand. All right, and that's fine. So agriculture and the creative sector, almost the same thing. Tamara, I saw you uh, you had unmuted to say something. I, I wanted to talk about the, the bank branch. Um, he talked about people feeling like they need to get dressed up to go. And one of the other things that I found that staying with this agriculture metaphor is that when I'm in a rural area, I love to see a bank with a muddy floor. I love it. Not because they haven't been cleaning it up, but because they're saying it's okay, farmer, for you to walk in in your muddy boots and do your business here. Because we know that you have muddy boots, that's your business. And I think there are some bank branches that are a little cooler than others. Maybe creatives would feel a little more comfortable there. Um, but I think it's not so much about looking like a banker to get a loan, but understanding each other and understanding um, the realities of each other so that we can tell those stories and that we can make good decisions. Um, I do wanna just say that the banking sector is about risk, but it's important that risk, um, we want our savings to be protected right? We want bankers to be risk averse when it comes to managing our deposits. Um, and so I think, you know, we, we do need to remember both sides of that story. All right. That's fantastic. Yes. Um, Wafa. Um, I think when you said how to educate, I would say go for them. Like you don't wait for your target partner, financial partner to know you, you have, they don't think of you, create the opportunity to educate them, let them know what you do. The first step is, and you don't need a huge budget and big conferences, you can be smart about it. Uh, the first, we call it a donor or investor engagement. The first and the easiest way, when you are as an artist or an NGO or, or, or an enterprise doing a project, and at the end, organizing what usually happen, a restitution session about what has been done and what you're doing. Don't only think of inviting as speakers or as things in that event only your usual stakeholder. Bring in your future target. So what prevents you from adding one guest in that panel just to let him hear what's happening in this sector? And that's the first stage. No need for budget. No need for sophisticated things. Just hook up. Start. Because sometimes the solution people because he would see he may become your best ally within his own system how to help you or how to change things so that the two words get together the answer will never come from us to the banking system the answer will only come and the sustainable and practical and applicable answer would come from the banker themselves with us feeding them with what we need who we are and how we operate we don't, we shouldn't be trying to give the solution because they are the expert. They know better their machine. What we have to do is to engage them and gain their, like not sympathy because we're doing business, we're creating, uh, uh, how to say, how creative, uh, riches, wealth, whether it is money or it is social, we create wealth. But we need to bring these people to uh, realize that we're important and we have value. And then they will find a way how to adjust, adapt their own systems and tools so that we are within their world. 
fantastic. And 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 I think that's the premise that we have been uh, working with uh, Kenya Bankers Association is that reel them in first of all, let them understand how the whole industry is working, and also begin to understand where the opportunities are to align uh, some of the activities in the creative sector with existing products that they that they that they already have, and then working towards a uh, known to to basically um and uh, unknown and and some of the comments that now that you're talking about are, are are quite easy quite practical i'm actually uh very impressed because i think we always start off thinking uh when you talk about a banker everybody thinks that uh, you must have the suit uh you basically must uh, look in a, a certain way i know fidelis you're not usually like that but um most people would be looking at uh there's a misunderstanding on on both sides from the creative there's a, an expectation this is a banker he's most likely to say no this is how i need to speak this is how i need to talk this is how he needs to understand me then from the banking point of view you already have formed uh, certain opinions against uh, the person who's actually coming to get this particular facility is how do we marry how do we marry the two and the challenge that I find that while COVID has provided certain very good opportunities for the creative sector, it has also created certain uh, challenges because right now the bank uh, uh, had to recover, uh, had to deal with uh, the financial implication of the lockdown, um, money not uh, coming out the way it was meant to. There were a great deal of defaults government then came in and said you cannot recover over this particular period of time there were projections that had actually been made so then coming back to tell them let's try out a new thing with this group of people that you think are risky all right uh the question is there must be a way to be able to say that I, I see a responsibility on the side of uh, Kenya bankers. I see the a responsibility on the side of the creative um, industry, but I also see a major role that uh, even FSD plays in trying to marry um, uh, these two uh, these two groups uh, uh, to, uh, to, together. So, um, what practical steps? Uh, and because uh, 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 Wafa has been talking about very practical things. What practical things do you think that the bank, um, the researcher, and players in the industry like myself can work on uh, to be able to fast track some of these uh, first of these steps? And of course, Wafa has uh, disappeared. Good. I'm so, also seeing we're being asked to wrap what, up, what? Roy. I don't know if you've seen that. Yeah, I've actually seen. Uh, I've actually was waiting for that question. By the way um so before we uh because wafa has not answered that um what can we say in closing uh, uh for creatives to access uh what is it called funding in this particular space uh just a, a quick round uh from uh fidelis what are the quick wins that you see for this particular space? Well, like you mentioned, um, COVID has brought with it uh, quite a number of challenges to the banking industry. And um, among those challenges are the way of sustaining the business. Like you mentioned, there are quite a number of people who unfortunately lost their revenue streams because of the challenges associated with some of them being laid off, others um, slowing down on business activities. But with those challenges, it also prevents, it gives us an opportunity to actually look at other ways of doing business. So the new normal, what people are calling the new normal, is that do not rely on the old traditional ways. Look at other ways of engaging the consumers. And what we are doing is part of that because we are looking at, hey, beyond the traditional salary paid employees, what else can we do to grow the banking uh, consumer base? And this is way of tapping into talents, creatives, and see whether we can bring them into the fold to enable them enjoy the services that the banks are offering, which ordinarily would not have happened before. So this presents a unique opportunity for us to look at ways of leveraging, even as we think that we are suffering. All right, then that, that is fine. Wafa, welcome back. I think my question was, what are the quick wins as we conclude? 
uh, for the um, uh, for the creative for the for the creative industry that they can do uh, almost immediately as they build towards fostering better relationships uh, between the financial sectors and the investors uh, and themselves. The good when um, it's it depends because every sector has its context. I don't have a standard answer to that. I think the more I can share okay. is the the strategy to make it happen. So take time very quickly as the way you map your audience to understand what attracted to the same way you do it with your potential financial supporter and then you see person what can i do or what can i offer to engage first with this person the first step to owner or an investor it's not to ask money if you want a long-term partner the first step is you ask to know him not even you ask him to know you try make a move who you are as a supporter what you do what you are interested in what are the partner that you're looking for because i am a partner for them and then the next step would be okay know me and then the third step would be okay i have something that might interest you and that's something that is interesting there your chances to get financed is 15 minutes before even you present your project because there you have gained a lot of understanding what he needs or what he's looking for and what are his constraints as said Tamara earlier, they are not the enemy. They also have strength and they also have obligation. Understand what motivates them, but also what are the constraints they will operate within. So you could propose something that it's a win-win. It's all about a win-win. All right. All right. Then. Fantastic. Tamara. I, I agree with both of um, the other panelists and what they've said. Maybe focus on is something that you said Roy around the CXO saying all the right things but then when it comes all the way down an institution they still are they don't have the freedom to operate in that same way and so I think what we could do is look at how can CXOs de-risk their own staff to be able to make um, new decisions um, and take listen to these stories and get to know people the way that Wafa has talked about, and, and so that they're able to make sound, good lending decisions based on the information they have, but um, with the support of senior leadership. Fantastic. Actually, very, very good point uh, there, there. I was just going through the questions that are there, and uh, one of them was, if somebody gets an informal loan, can they register it in uh, CRB to show that they paid it back? or is uh, CRB just for institutions? Uh, um, the CRB system as it stands now, they are, the sources of information is basically controlled by the Central Bank of Kenya. So what would happen is the Central Bank is very clear of what kind of information goes in there. Because again, informal loans are by their nature not very informal, shall we say. So <laughs> <laughs> it tends not to be able to I mean, checking against it and relying on it, uh, depending on the source, of course. So those are the issues that the central bank is trying to guard against. Okay, then that is uh, that is fine. I know we have almost run out of uh, time, but um, and uh, I had the uh, the final remarks. But the thing is, is that uh, I'm actually happy that there's a whole ecosystem of people where financial institutions um institutions like uh, financial sector deepening who are and uh, of course um people like wafa who have put together um, uh ecosystems and um, opportunities and platforms for people to be able to interact uh in building in building this and i believe um with this ecosystem then we are closer to facilitating access to uh, to to credit it may not be immediate, um, but there are some uh, immediate wins that can actually be uh, done as uh, as quickly as possible. But for a longer term, mid term, structured way of, uh, of of lending, there is work that needs to be to be done. And I want to thank each uh, uh, each and every one of you, my panel, uh, Wafa. Your name always makes me hesitate before I, I, I say it. Um, and thank you very much for joining us uh, from uh, Tunisia. Thank you for the good work that you're doing, especially with the uh, um, Culture Funding Watch. Uh, Tamara Cook, thank you very much uh, for the role that FSD is uh, is playing and uh, even the active role that you're playing right now with Art at Work and, uh, and uh, Kenya Bankers Association.
Fidelis, thank you very much for also facilitating member banks to understand the equity sector. Um, and we should be looking for solutions very, very soon. Um, I have been your moderator, uh, Roy Gitahe. Thank you very much for joining us on our fat production. Um, and uh, it's uh, over to you. Um, thank you. Fano. Thank you. Thank you so much, guys. All right. Strano? Yes, thank you, Roy. And thank you, Tamara, Wafa, and Fidelis. That was a fantastic panel. Thank you so much. And it's really opened the eyes of a lot of creatives listening in uh, from all over Eastern Africa as well. Uh, very well done. Uh, we're just going to quickly switch the stage to the showcase as we prep the next panel. Um, so thank you very much to the audience. Uh, stand by for the decimators. Coming up right after this will be the final panel for the sixth Eastern Africa Music Summit on GEA 2021. And it's about what the rest of the world thinks about music from Eastern Africa. We have representatives from every continent. So stay tuned. Now going to a showcase, we'll be right back.